Death Valley. It can mean two different college football stadiums, separated by 650 miles. But sorry, Tigers fans. No, the other Tigers fans. The South Carolinians had it first. Let me tell you the stories behind that and the other traditions that helped build a champion. Gridiron Traditions is built by the Home Depot. Clemson's return to national prominence feels a little different because it looks a little different. Their aesthetic grabs your eyeballs in a way those of other powers don't. It's not that they've gone wild with alternate jerseys, but you don't need to when your color scheme is bright orange and royal purple. A purple so royal, its official name is Regalia. That's definitely more interesting than the staid reds and blues of other perennial contenders. The Tigers used to switch up their combinations a lot more, but they've since settled into mostly orange over white at home and all white on the road, both complemented by an orange helmet with a white tiger paw that's looked largely the same since 1970. They'll mix in a purple jersey, maybe even with purple pants, once a year as a nod to Purple Heart recipients on Military Appreciation Day. But the most lasting uni tradition in Tigertown comes in the form of orange britches. Orange britches. I like that they call them britches for one. It's important to stay regional. We love college football because it's regional. And I think it's important to keep the parlance, uh, you know, local. Clemson first wore orange britches in 1980. Mired in a 5-5 five five season, Coach Danny Ford was searching for extra motivation when he surprised his players with the pants before their season-ending game against number 14 South Carolina. Ford had ordered the pants prior to the season, but waiting to break them out for the Palmetto Bowl proved powerful, as the Tigers scored a 27-6 upset win. They were immediately popular with players and fans, and the fact that their next 12 games after their first appearance comprised Clemson's undefeated national championship season of 1981, only added to their mystique. They won a ton in the orange britches under Ford, but not as much in that aforementioned visual mishmash era of Tommy Bowden. It took Dabo Sweeney designating the orange pants for championship clinching games only, be that division, conference, national, state, or insert bowl here, to re-inject them with significance. The color is so ingrained in the cultural paw print of Clemson that Tiger supporters wear solid orange every Friday. But just like we had to remind LSU about who had the Death Valley name first, Clemson wouldn't have its orange or its name if its first football coach, Walter Riggs, hadn't reportedly cribbed them from his alma mater, Auburn. Instead of getting too bogged down in these hard to source origin stories again, let's give Clemson props for something documented. According to a 1978 Sports Illustrated report, their Tiger mascot, borrowed as it may be, started doing push-ups for every Clemson point scored. Zach Mills was in the suit back then, and whether he really invented this tradition on a whim isn't certain, but you'd be hard-pressed to find an earlier reference to it. Clemson has another mascot too, the Cub. I really only bring this up so we can talk about how rare it is to see a fractional jersey number, MLB publicity stunts notwithstanding. The clown shoe Nikes are simply the cherry on top. The pre-swoosh uniform days actually brought us another documented Clemson first, if we're counting the school's game program as strong documentation. The October 7th, 1995 copy said these Russell Athletic Buttes were college football's first turn back the clock uniforms. They were throwing it all the way back to 1939, the year they played in and won their first bowl game. In case you needed more evidence for the Auburn inspo, your eyes aren't lying. They hadn't quite landed on purple rather than navy back then. Those were simpler times. So was much of Clemson history when compared to making four national title games in five years and winning two college football playoff crowns in the process. You can't take for granted the heights to which the Dabo Sweeney era has vaulted the program. In the 1970s, when its trophy case was empty, Clemson wasn't the major draw that it is now. That seemed to affect how interested rival teams like Georgia Tech were in hosting them. It inspired George Bennett, an executive director of the Tigers' Ipte Booster Club, to find a way to prove Clemson fans' economic might. Bennett didn't set out to begin a tradition but our Ryan Hockensmith saw it firsthand when surrounded by orange-clad fans on a flight to one of those CFP finals. And they were super friendly and nice, and I took my headphones out and I enjoyed the conversation. But what really struck me was they were handing out money. And I was like, 
hey, that's an easy way to my heart. Give me some money, you know? And they gave me money and I looked at it and it was $2 bills with the Clemson paw print on it. A $2 bill is rare enough to get your attention on its own, which is why it was the currency of choice. But that paw print stamp makes it unmistakable. We've traveled to your city, and here's the proof of our spending power, thank you. When Clemson fans shout their cadence count, T-I-G-E-R-S, fight, 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 They're putting their money where their mouths are. Some local banks even keep the stamps on hand for customers' convenience. But they do need to limit the number of bills per person so that everyone who wants to participate has a chance. It's probably 50% of the $2 bills on earth are flowing through Clemson because they have wanted to make a point for almost five decades now. When you play Clemson, we come with the team. Those fans are just as present back on campus where they line the path for the Tiger Walk. Yeah, Auburn and LSU, these guys do a Tiger Walk too. But their walk of champions is different than Alabama's since it takes place inside the stadium in full uniform. Memorial Stadium specifically is where we find the rest of our interconnected rituals. In 1945, a decade and change before LSU's earliest association with the moniker, Presbyterian college coach Lonnie McMillan called Clemson college football's Death Valley. It was the September heat that was more inhospitable than the fans, but McMillan had been to the actual Mojave Desert, so he knew what he was saying. I actually used to run the stairs in the stadium during the summer just because it gets so hot outside and you will sweat profusely. Running the stairs in that stadium is, it's like literal death. But yes, it gets freaking hot in there. It's so hot. I will say that Clemson has as much a right to the title Death Alley as anyone because it's steep. It's a very steep stadium. If you're sitting up top, it looks like you're watching coaches film because it's just X's and O's. That's how far up you are. Additionally, they've got the rock. So in terms of props, it's basically 1-0 Clemson over LSU. Ah, yes, Howard's Rock. So named for longtime coach Frank Howard, who initially used the thing as a doorstop. It was given to him by alum Sam Jones, who scooped it up from the Mojave in the 1960s. It ended up in its current exalted place because Howard just wanted it out of his office. Booster Gene Williman is the one who decided to make arrangements to put it atop the hill. In 1967, Howard came around on The Rock's potential as a motivator, telling his players if they weren't gonna give him 110%, they could keep their filthy hands off his rock. Rubbing that mystical rock is just a preamble to what Brent Musburger called, The most exciting 25 seconds in college football. Running down the hill was originally just the most practical way to get from the field house where the Tigers got dressed onto the field. Now there's a whole masterclass in building anticipation. The crowd can track the player's bus arrival through the stadium video board. The run delivers on that hype. And don't go thinking it's as easy as it looks. I have been at the top of the hill and I could never, my knees, my shins, whatever part of my body would not allow me to run down the hill. I don't know how Dabo runs down the hill. I could like, even if I was in the most athletic shoe wear possible, if they put cleats on me, I just feel like it's almost impossible. That's why you see a lot of players like jumping and landing because really it is such a steep hill. Injury hazards aside, the rush players get from running the same hill as the legends and champions before them, proves the magnitude of being a part of something with this much history. You don't have to strap on a helmet to get that feeling at Clemson. Clemson gets to do one thing that I think most teams should be able to do, which is after the game, in an orderly fashion, once everything's settled down, there is not a rush of the field, but you can walk onto the field. Once they get the team off, you can go. It kind of makes everybody feel like that's your field, that's your grass, that's your place to commune, and where you can sit there and, as I saw, throw a ball to a kid in the same end zone that Clemson scores in. That's cool. I, I, My favorite part about the Clemson experience is being able to go on the field afterwards and not get tackled by police. Turns out Death Valley sounds like a nice place to visit this time of year. That goes for either of them. But in the interest of fairness, I gotta tell you that when you hear the bands playing Tiger Rag, LSU did get to that one first. This episode of Gridiron Traditions is built by The Home Depot how doers get more done.